Hello and welcome to BST Live, the show for systematic and algorithmic traders. Great to have you here today, where we're going to be talking about something extremely timely, given what has been happening in the market, especially the last few days. We're going to be talking about pullbacks and bear markets. And joining us today is Larry Tentarelli. Welcome back, Larry. I haven't seen you on the show for years, but it's great to have you here. Andrew, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I was actually going to look up um, you know, what year, I think it was maybe four or five years ago you were on the show last, and you know, we had a really great chat about your trading style, and uh, yeah, it's really good to have you here again today. Can't wait to hear what you've uh, got to share with us. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. I think it, was, I think it was 2017, and I am glad to be back. Wow. Okay. Time goes fast, doesn't it? Time goes it, by it, fast, I should say. <laughs> it does. It really does. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about pullbacks and bear markets today and uh, very timely, given, given what's happening in the markets at the moment. But before we get into that, how about can you share a little bit of background on yourself and how you got started in trading, just so that we can get some context around what we're going to talk about today? Sure. So I, I started in the markets actively in 1998. So I was a broker with Merrill Lynch for five years. Uh, I grew up in the business. My family was in the business. So I took an interest in the market starting probably when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. Uh, and I started to learn, read about the markets. But I, I got actively involved trading 1998. Right. Okay. Sorry, I just missed the button there. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, I wondered. I wondered where you went. But yeah, nineteen. <laughs> I, I was always but, interested, but yeah. nineteen ninety eight. I got my. Uh, I got my license, and I went into production with Merrill. Mm, yep. Yeah, okay. And then, um, if we fast forward to today, then can you give us a little bit of an indication on um, the the markets you like to trade and the the type of well, I guess the trading styles that you like to employ. Sure. So what I do is intermediate to longer term trend following. My my general holding period based on how the market is trending, anywhere from three to six months or six to 12 months, I focus on large caps, the mega caps, high volume stocks, a few ETFs, but primarily the bigger stocks, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Bank of America, the, the big institutional liquid names. Mm. And why is it that you focus on those um, those particular uh, stocks? You know, I'm, I'm more comfortable with those. They're very liquid. I can get in and out very easily with small caps. You run into a situation where sometimes if the market's very thin, you can't get a good fill. But when I first started in the in the market, my mentor was always, he always focused on the big high volume names. So I just naturally gravitate there. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to uh, look at a few of those today, uh, a little bit oh. uh, later in the show, but let's um, let's get to the topic first, which was uh, buying dips and avoiding bear markets. Yes. And uh, which, which is very timely, uh, given what's happening in the markets, especially the last couple of days and weeks. But uh, yeah. I guess, I guess a common, um, you know, concern with traders, especially when we have uh, pullbacks in the market is, um, you know, is it just a pullback or is it st the start of something more? So sure. um, today we're obviously going to talk about both of those, but why do you think it's so important to be able to distinguish between the two? For me, what, what I do, I look primarily at, at the price trend. So what I want to see is higher highs, higher lows, rising moving averages. And when I see that, it, it tells me that the predominant trend is higher and I feel confident holding the, you know, holding my positions and adding on pullbacks where it starts to get a little bit trickier for me is if we start to get lower highs, lower lows, or if we lose those moving averages, then I start to get a little more cautious on the indices. And that's where we are right now. We've got lower highs, lower lows. We're below the 50-day moving average. So that's basically told me to play more defense right now. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So why do you look at those particular things? So you've talked about uh, high highs and high lows, the so price action and some basic indicators. Why sure. are those and not something else? To me, to me, price is the most consistent. So it indicate. I'm not a big fan of, of indicators. And the reason is that indicators are a derivative of the price. 
So we mm-hmm. could look at relative strength. I've seen relative strength be overbought and the stock just keeps going higher. I've seen relative strength be oversold. The stock goes right through it. So I haven't, I haven't found any indicator that's more reliable than price. And that's why I focus on that trend. When I see higher highs and higher lows and rising moving averages, that tells me full speed ahead. Once they start to go down in the other direction, then I get much more cautious. But I, I haven't found any indicator that's better than, than just the price trend. Mm-hmm. Okay, so are you looking for, I guess, a confluence there where you you, you want to see um, the indicators that you do use and the, the price action matching? Or how do you look at those together? So I look at, I don't, the only indicator I look at sometimes consistently is relative strength. But for the most part, it's going to be price trend. And then moving averages is number two for me. And that moving averages are a very big focus for me. And the reason that I like moving averages is they're, they're, they're black and white. So if, if we look at, at chart patterns or indicators, I might look at a chart pattern and say this is a, a double top. And somebody else might look at it and say, well, that's a, a, you know, a, a double bottom or a V bottom or whatever. But a moving average, the price is either over the moving average or under it. The moving average is either going up, down, or sideways. There's really no subjectivity to it whatsoever. Mm, yeah. Yeah. We've got a question here in the chat from Ilya. Okay. Um, I might just put this up because it's timely for what we're just talking about now. How do you sure. define higher highs or rising moving averages? You see, I think I think those are both pretty much self-explanatory on the screen. So if I see the, the trend, then we can look at some charts in a few minutes. But if I see that price trend going higher, then I know that I've got higher highs, higher lows. If I see those moving averages rising, then I know that I've got an uptrend. Yeah, so if you're looking at the, the price action there, have you found that... Um, you know the the length or the the depth or speed of the pullback is indicative of something further on. Yes, yes, that's and that's a very good question. So what what I look for is I look at the daily range. So when I see the and let me know if you want me to turn on some charts, I can turn on some charts and that might help to explain it. But when when I see a very narrow daily range then that tells me that that the market is fairly quiet. But once we see the daily range, and if people use candlesticks or daily bars, once that daily range starts to expand, especially to the downside, it makes me much more cautious. Mm, right, okay. And are you are you talking about uh, um, individual stocks here or, or the market in general? Or do you both. like compare both? Right, okay. So both. are you comparing so, the two or... Yes. So here's here's what I do when when the stock market, when the index itself is in a primary uptrend, then I focus more on the individual charts, the stock charts. If the index starts to weaken like it has right now, then I'm much more defensive on my new buys. And even if I see a stock starting to break out, but the overall index is going down, I'll often hold off. So I, I'd like to see a rising, either a flat or a rising index. If the index is pulling back, I'm much more defensive because it, even though individual stocks can break out, oftentimes a, a falling index will pull down most stocks. Mm, yeah. I guess in that situation, timing is pretty important, right? Because yes. uh, you, get in at the, <laughs> you get in at the wrong time and, and uh, you know, it can be damaging to your account. So how do you go about or what are you looking for when to try and determine when is the right time to consider something in the markets if well i go back to the index trend so can we go right. on to an index chart for a second yeah sure can, can i share just, a chart yep i'll put that up on the screen now Here okay so let let me know if you yep, can, see. can see so i all right so i just dialed up the s p chart so let's see it's okay so you can see my s p chart right Okay, so the the first thing that I look at when I see higher highs, so if we take a look at these price highs, you can see for the most part, the index is trending higher, 
the 50 day moving average is trending higher. So anything here, all of these tests down to the 50 day held a brief blip right here. But for the most part, every pullback to the 50 day moving average held, the, the moving average itself is rising. And we can see we basically have the price points, the highs keep going up. So, so this tells me anytime the market is in this type of an uptrend, then I'm going to be, I'm going to push uh, stock trades on the long side. But what happened is, is once the, once the S&P came down and lost this 50 day moving average, that told me number one, be a little bit more defensive because the, the other thing I, I don't like about the way it lost the 50 day was that it was a big gap down and you can see the big red bar. So, so this told me at this point to go from, let's say, full speed ahead green to this, this breakdown right here told me to be much more cautious. And, and I usually buy the pullbacks, but I haven't bought a, uh, I haven't bought a pullback or I haven't bought anything in the past 10 days. Mm. And why is that? What are you seeing in the market that's stopping you from uh, buying a pullback? couple of things. So this, this first breakdown, this big red bar, very cautionary. The fact that S&P ran up into the 20 day moving average and failed, the 20 day moving average has started to roll over. It's crossed the 50 day to the downside. And the S&P is just making consistent lower lows right now. So, so all this tells me is to be more cautious. So, so I trade I don't predict. And, and I've been in markets long enough to know that that just when the market looks like the bottom is going to come out of it, it can reverse higher right away. So it looked very bad here. It looked very bad here. So just because the market looks weak, I'm not going to predict any further downside. But once we had this breakdown, this tells me right now to hold off on any new buys until I see some major strength back to the upside. Mm, yeah. yeah. One of the um, the statements you made there was about being more defensive when you see some of mm -hmm. these signs. How do you um, how do you how do you manage trades that you're currently in when you start seeing signs like that? So a couple of things and I'll, I'll go back to a trade that I just uh, closed out early. So I was in Regeneron. And I had a stop on my trailing stop on a Regeneron off the top of my head was somewhere in this neighborhood. As soon as it went through the 50 day moving average very quickly, I cut that position right away. I use the 50 day moving average extensively. And, mm -hmm. and what I'll do is, is I'll have stops in the system. But if I see the market start to get a little bit slippery, what I'll do is I'll look at my positions and I'll say, which, which are my core positions? So I've got positions like Tesla, uh, you know, Wells Fargo, let's call those core positions. And then I've got the secondary positions like the Regeneron position that I might, if I'm looking to raise cash right away, I'll look to those secondary positions to, to cut my risk. But right now I've got more cash now than I've had since, uh, this is the most cash I've got now since probably April to May of 2020. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I've got a question here from Ola. Uh, this one popped up just as we were talking about um, how you consider um, the index as well as individual stocks. Thanks for the question, Ola. Do you consider sectors as well as the whole market trend? Absolutely. And, and that's a very good question. So right now, so my, my one of my best positions right now is Devon Energy. And I, and I recently did a blog on Devon. I took the position about three weeks ago. And the, the energy sector right now, even though the S&P is weaker, if we take a look at the energy sector, the energy sector is very strong. Uh, the banking sector, so if we take a look at XLF, we can see we took a look at the S&P. The S&P is rolling over, NASDAQ 100 is rolling over. But if we take a look at the financial sector, it's very near a breakout level. If we take a look at, let's say, Bank of America, we can see Bank of America 
is holding up very well. So I do pay very close attention to the sector. So if we look at these charts and I've got some bank positions, I've got some energy positions. So Devon is a position that I took on September 14th and this has been a very nice breakout so far. So I, and that's a very good question. I do pay attention to the sectors as well as the stocks. Mm, yeah. If we look at the, uh, some of the examples you just put up on the screen there, um, and you're you're watching the moving averages. I can't see what values they are. They look like 20, 50, and 200. Yes, it. 20, 20, 50, 100, 200. Right, okay, yeah. So if you look at those examples, there's quite a few, um, I guess, bearish crosses in some of those moving averages that haven't worked out. How do you... Right. Uh, why do you think that is, and how do you avoid you know, getting caught in that, I guess, trap? And, and that's a that's a good question. So I don't use moving average crosses for the most part. I'm looking at price versus the moving average. But what I found is that moving average crosses are more reliable if they're with the direction of the of the primary trend. So what I mean by that is if the stock overall is trending higher, then what I found is that the bullish moving average crosses are generally more reliable. Now, if a stock will take a stock in a downtrend, like let's say a stock like Fastly, if what I found is that in a downtrend, I want to focus more on the moving average crosses that are in the same direction as the key trend. So in a downtrend, I want to look for the bearish, bearish crosses in an uptrend, I want to look for the bullish crosses. So I'm looking for the two time frames to confirm each other. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Larry. So we've got a couple more questions in the chat here. Sure. Um, I want to get I want to get into um, bear markets in a minute, but we'll address okay. some of these questions because they're they're timely for what we're talking about. So we've got another sure. one here from Ola. Ola is a regular. Always got great questions. Thanks, Ola. How do you use Excellent. volatility in your trading, VIX or stock volatility? Good question. So I, I don't trade the VIX. I don't trade any, any derivatives of the VIX. Now for stock volatility, that goes back to that average daily range. So when, when, I, when I skip back to these charts, it doesn't create a problem, does it, Andrew, for your system? No, no I'll switch okay. it back on. Yep. So, so to so. give you an idea, if we take a look at this Apple chart, if you see the big red bar, so that's the first thing that I look for. So when I see uh, a decline, when I see the little red bars, it really doesn't bother me too much. And, and I just take this as normal volatility. But once we see this big range expansion, whether it's to the downside or it's to the upside, when I see the big range expansion, I tend to give a little more credence to the move uh, then these, you know, so if I see these lower, lower range red bars, that doesn't mean a lot to me. This is a little more mm -hmm. cautious, but once I see that, that volatility pick up through the range expansion, then, then that's another warning sign. And, and the same thing for breakouts. When we see a stock that breaks out, if we go back to this Devon chart, when we see a stock that starts to break out, so you can see it was in a range. But then it started, there's a, a big black bar here, and then there's another big black bar here. If we take a look on some of these uh, agriculture right now, you can see like, like Nutrien, $38 billion market cap. You see the, the big black bar breakout. So when I see that, mm. that range expand in either direction, it tells me that, that that move might have a little more to it. Yeah, right. And how did you come up with that um, observation? Was that tested in any way or is it just uh, a lot like of years of a lot of testing, a lot of, of real world experience, a lot of trial and error? I do a lot with with average true range with ATR. So and, and that was taught to me a while ago. But but most of what I do is all it, it's been trial and error what's worked for me in the past, what hasn't worked for me. And, and what I try to do is I try to simplify and be as consistent as I can. So anything that has to do with price, if, it, if it's range expansion, things like that, that's what I'm looking for. Mm, yep. 
I think that's a um, a good valuable lesson for traders is to try and simplify things and keep it pretty simple. Um, we've got a question here from. Oh, sorry, Larry, were you going to say something or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no. Sorry. Um, so next, uh, there's a question here from Adam in the chat. This is a good one. Uh, it sounds like you use a lot of discretion in your trading. Are there systematic rules you follow or stick to? And and that's a good question. And I used to have just a, a system that I followed. And if I ran, uh, let's say, a, a shorter term system, I would stick more with, with predefined rules. So buy at a certain level, sell at a certain level, predefine my exits on the upside. But I do use a little bit more discretion as far as my stock selection. I could automate most of it. So I, I could I could build screeners that say, you know, only screen for stocks with a certain relative strength or, or things like that. And, and I used to in the past, but but I like to have a little bit of feel to it. But it, it could be automated because all the factors that I use are technical. So I could automate it if I if I wanted to, but right now I don't automate it. Yeah. Yeah. And why is it that you like to have a little bit of discretion in in your trading? I, I think due to my experience, because I've been doing this now for 23 years, and, and I think that there's certain things that that I pick up on from having looked at, at tens of thousands of charts and, and been trading, you know, for 23 years. There are certain things that I pick on, pick up on a little bit before the market, and I and I like to use my experience. Mm, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's a common answer, actually, I think, um, among traders who've traded a long time, like uh, Linda Rashke said a similar thing when I asked her, and she uses discretion, but she's also uh, got a little bit of an algo band, I guess, and she's basing studies on statistical, um, you know, methods. So I think there's, um, maybe there's some valid validity in uh, mixing the two when you've got enough experience to be able to identify those types of things. And, and you know, that's what it is, because when, when I, a lot of what I do is quantitative as far as when I run my screeners, I run technical screeners, I use the moving averages, my stop, you know, everything is systematic as far as my stops go. But I do incorporate some discretion just based because I could set up a program that, you know, I could buy based off of this, you know, set the exit on the upside, set the stop on the downside and just let it go. So I use a lot of, of technicals to it but I do like to incorporate some of my experience. Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, Larry. We've got another question here from Ola. Ola is sure. on fire today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ola. Do you use hard stops or price structure for exits? So in, in the beginning, I use hard stops. So once I take a position, I set my stops. So I run trend following stops from it's generally anywhere from, from 10 to 12 to 15% based on the volatility of the stock. And then I'll start to trail it up over time. But I, but I use hard stops. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and all my open positions right now, I've got open stops in the system. So if they hit, they hit, but it, it's all hard stops. Yeah, right. So what if the, um, if the conditions of the market change, do you just continue trailing or do you override the stops or how do you manage that when there, there you're in a, are, there in a are, bit of a transition? Yeah, there are some times when I'll override the stop. So I'll never extend my stop, but I'll often shorten the stop. So in the in the situation with Regeneron, like we talked about, my my stop was underneath where I closed out the position, but I saw the market start to get a little bit slippery. I saw that Regeneron position start to unwind. And as soon as it cut through the 50-day moving average, I just cut it right away. So there, there will be times if volatility picks up that I'll, I'll cut a position or, you know, I might cut positions early to reduce my risk, but I'll never extend the stop and widen my risk. Mm, okay. All right. Thanks, Larry. Uh, sure. One more question here, and then we'll uh, switch to bear market discussion. So okay. this question here is from Bron Bronan. Bronan. What do you think about situations where several tickers have similar charts with some of them breaking out and then some of them lagging? I always want to go with the strongest charts. So I'm, I'm always going to go. So if I'm looking at several tickers, I want to look for the strongest relative strength stocks. I want to look for the ones that are breaking out first. 
and I want to avoid the laggers. And that's what got me into Devon, because if you take a look for a second, so Devon, it was the, the top performing large cap stock in the market today. I think it, it may be the top performing stock in the S&P 500 for the past three weeks or so. But the reason I took this was this was the strongest energy stock on my screen. If we take a look, for example, at, at Exxon, when I took that Devon position, Exxon was, was right down here. So I wanna, I wanna look for stocks ideally that are trading up in this upper right-hand corner. But to answer the question, if, if I always wanna go with the strongest stocks, strongest RSI, uh, closest to the breakout level, if there's a group of them. Hmm. Yep, okay. All right, thanks, Larry. So um, sure. I guess now let's talk a little bit about uh, that transition from pullback into bear market. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, then maybe we can look at what's happening in the markets now. But what type of things or what clues are you looking for during that transition to indicate that maybe this is more than just a uh, a normal pullback? What we what we just talked about. So so what we have right now is more cautionary for me in the S and P. And if if I can go back to that chart for a second, so and and I'm not and I'm not bearish. So I don't want people to to listen to me and and think that I'm bearish because, like I said, I I trade, I don't predict. So I'm I'm going to react to what's going on on the screen. But but when I see mm. the 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 big drop below the 50 day, the failure at the 20 day, the 20 day crossing the 50 day, and and right now just gradually lower lows in the S and P. When I see all of that, so I, I'm over 40 percent cash right now, and that's a lot of cash for me because I normally am about five to 10% cash. So what happens is if the markets start to weaken and if my positions start to weaken, like we took a look at the Regeneron position. Now this was a profitable position, but I, I closed it out. Uh, I had a position in triple Q that was profitable. I closed out that position. Uh, so what happens is as the markets start to weaken, as I start to close these positions, if I don't see signs of stability, then I just sit on the cash mm -hmm. and I just let the cash build and build and build until I see you know signs of a reversal. So if the markets keep going lower, then I'm going to have stops get hit along the way, but I'm not going to just go out and say, okay, I got stopped out of you know XYZ stock. Let me go buy something else. I'm going to sit on the money. Yeah, right. So what would have to happen right now for you to, to confirm to you that it, that we're in a bear market? To, to confirm that we're in a bear market. So I use the technical definition. Right. So I would so technical definition of a bear market is 20% peak to peak to trough drawdown. That would tell me that we're in a bear market. To tell me that we're in in a downtrend, I just need to see what I see right now, which says that we're in, in a, a near term downtrend. So I don't want to buy into that near term downtrend. And it just has me more cautious. But if this if the biggest thing is if price keeps making lower lows and lower highs, that's going to keep me on the defensive. If I were to see a big reversal higher, you know, maybe the market's up two or three percent on the day with very high volume then that would tell me that possibly a low was in and possibly there was a reversal. But for right now, mm. I'm more defensive. And like I said, I, I haven't taken any new positions in the past 10 days. It's been nine or 10 days, whatever, since that Friday. Uh, and I might soon, I'm looking at the bank stocks right now and I'm looking at tech, but in order for me to take a, a tech position, I'm going to want to see probably a big flush and reversal in the market. Mm, okay. Uh, I've seen you, um, I don't recall if it was on your Twitter feed or your website, um, but in the past you've talked about uh, looking at internals or market internals to, uh, I guess, judge the, the strength or weakness of the market. Is that still the case now? Slightly. So so what I've looked at over the past couple years or so, and, and I use this to a degree, so the McClellan Oscillator, so NIMO, this is for the New York Stock Exchange. 
But but what I found is once it gets down, let's call it negative 50, negative 60, once it gets down into that negative 50 to negative 60 level, it often marks a reversal higher in the market. But I, I do not use this as the buy signal. So if I so I bought uh, and, and it's on my Twitter feed. I bought this pullback, this pullback here, and I'm pretty sure here. But I don't use the indicator. So I'm not going to look at, at NIMO and it says oversold and then just go out and buy stocks. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at, at NIMO, but then I want to see the market start to move higher, big moves on big volume. And then that that will tell me maybe this rubber band is ready to stretch back to the upside. But I, I don't use indicators and I don't use oversold as a buy signal because they're just indicators. I need to see the market and I need to see these stocks start to take off to the upside. Right. OK. And when you say uh, big move and big volume, what exactly do you mean there? Is there some kind of uh, quantified method or... How do you judge that? I'd say uh, 150% of average daily volume and then mm. a, a, a one or two ATR move to the upside. Mm. Okay. And you can you can often see it. Oftentimes, you'll just get a flush in the market. So when Triple Q came down here, it was down to about a, a 34 daily RSI. But, but what you'll often see intraday, and, and we've seen it a, a few times, over the past week or so, it just hasn't held, is what you'll mm -hmm. often see is, is often a high volume gap down. And then all of a sudden, like a rubber band, things will start to go back up, the buyers will come in, and then the volume starts to come in. So you'll see that often, we just haven't seen it right now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so why that particular um, oscillator, and why not something else like tick is quite popular and and other market in, internals uh, indicators. Why McClelland Oscillator? It, it's just the one that I've used for a while. So I, I can't say that McClelland is any better than Tick or you know NYAD, anything like that. But, but I, I think what I do is if I'm comfortable with it and I've had consistent results with it, I'll stick with it. But I can't say that that one is better than the other. It's like trading signals. I might use moving averages. The person next door might use Bollinger Bands. Uh, somebody else might use a, a volatility contraction pattern. And if you've if you're consistent with it, and you've had enough success with it, then you can really make anything work as long as you 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 know are consistent with it. So I mm -hmm. use what I use. It doesn't mean it's any better than what you might use, but it works for me because I've got so much experience with it. Mm, okay. And then, so if we do get into a bear market, what do you trade in a bear market? How do you, or how do you trade? What what do you trade in a bear market? A, a lot of cash. And then I would look for what's going up. So maybe treasuries will be going up. So maybe uh, something like TMF or one of the levered treasury funds. Uh, usually, uh, I, I haven't gone heavy short in about two or three years. I think it was 2018 since I was heavy short. So in, in the 2020 bear market, I didn't short anything. And I could have made a lot more money if I shorted, but I didn't because the market moved so fast. I went to cash, but I didn't short anything. So if the mark, if we started to go into a, a real bear market, then I would imagine that treasuries would start to perform pretty well. So maybe something like TMF or whatever the, you know, the triple lever treasury fund is. And then I would I would look to see if there's any other uptrends, maybe agriculture. You know, if you take a look right now, the, the markets are pretty weak, but the, uh, the commodity ETF, so DBC, and this is primarily energy, but the markets are weak, but this is breaking out. If we take a look at the agriculture ETF, DBA, this is very close to breaking out. So, so I'm primarily going to look for uptrends somewhere. Uh, you know, if if stocks really start to break down and then money starts to go into treasuries, this would probably turn around. Or you have you have short ETFs, you know, SDS, SH, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the, the short ETFs are. 
And if the market starts to break down, they'll go into an uptrend. So I might look at something like that. But pri my primary focus is the long side. And if markets start to get weaker, I'll just have a lot of cash. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, in in a, a bear market, um, traders you know tend to tend to like to trade, and in a bear sure. market, there may be less opportunities, especially if you're a long only trader. You've mentioned a couple of opportunities there or or options, but how do you control the urge to trade? Do you is that a problem for you or no problem? It, it, no problem. No problem. And and you know why? I learned the hard way. So so I came up. I cut my teeth in the in the nasdaq.com dot com bubble so mm. i got my production <laughs> number in 1999 and and i everything i bought in 1999 i was a genius you know fiber <laughs> optic stocks home depot ge didn't matter nortel networks and then everything started to go down and mm. i chased them down it, you know oh nortel's great and and uh, you know i i blew through probably two or three accounts over the, you know, in, in the early years, in my first five years, I probably blew up two or three accounts. So finally, I had the conversation with myself. And I said, either I can keep being reckless and treat it like it's, you know, the racetrack, and I'm never going to succeed. And I might as well just stop. Or I can get serious about it. So I analyzed what my mistakes were. Over trading was my number one biggest mistake. So once I realized that that I was my own worst enemy, so I have zero ish, I have zero FOMO, I have no issue. I can just sit and just let the because I know when when it's time to go, I have no problem loading up. But sometimes you have to be able to just sit back and wait and let cash build and then wait till you get the right signal. And then when you get the right signal, you can you can load up. But if you're buying every single day and, and getting caught up in all the volatility, when it's finally time to go, you might not have either the mental capacity left over, mm. you might not have the financial capital left over. So I would just rather sit and say, okay, I'm gonna let the buyers and the sellers fight it out right now. And I'm gonna sit here with a pile of cash and when I see the sign, and I buy some high octane stuff, I've got Tesla, I've got Nvidia, I've got a firm, you know, I've got some high, and I've got some boring things, you know, I've got energy stocks, I've got bank stocks, but I have zero. I can sit, and and also though, keep in mind, I've got a longer term time frame, so I'm not actively, so I'm not actively trading for money right now, because I've built up a, a decent amount of capital. But if I was trading for, you know, if I was a day trader or a swing trader, then I would find there's always something going up somewhere. Like we looked at these energy stocks, we looked at these bank stocks, you know, I would be trading these energy stocks, but I would find something if I needed to trade right now, I could find plenty of things to buy. Mm, okay. Great advice there, Larry. Thank you very much for sharing that one. Thank you. Um, uh, we've got another question here in the chat from... Guess who? It's Ola again. Ola, <laughs> Thank hello, you, Ola. Ola. So many questions today. Great. Um, yeah. Larry, how did you trade the big dip last year? That That's a, a good question. So I've got a, a big blog on my website, and I won't go into it, but they can check on the blog. But basically what I did is as the market started breaking down in February and March, I was just cutting my risk, cutting my positions, and I was eventually 100% cash by about the middle of March. And then I think my first buy uh, off the top of my head, my first buy, I was 100% cash. And my first buy was, I think, the technology ETF XLK. I put about 8 to 10% of my money in that. It started to work. And then I bought Microsoft. And then so what happened was after I thought maybe the flush is out of the way, I, I gradually started to, to stagger myself back into the market. So I made a test buy. And if the test buy works and starts to go up, then I commit more capital. If the test buy doesn't work, then I don't commit any more capital. So I, I, I did manage to get out. And like I said, the, the blogs on my website, they can read through it. I've got the screenshots and you know real time on the Twitter feed. But I managed to get out, avoid most of the downdraft, and then gradually just start to get back in. But it, it's, I was, I, I didn't go all the way in. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I put one toe in the water and I don't think that I got fully invested for maybe, you know, 90 days. It was a very, because that was a very dicey market. That was the fastest mm. drawdown, fastest major drawdown I've ever been through. It was, it was dicey. It was, it was dicey. Mm. Yeah. Yep. And so when you say test buy, what do you mean by that? Do you have a uh, specific process you do? particular yeah. percentage so, of account or yeah. Yeah, so I'll take so if I'm in a hundred percent cash which, which I was at the time I took I believe it was an eight percent position so I took an ETF XLK which is the technology ETF and I just took the position because it, it was the best chart on my screen so you know of the technology stocks at the time and if mm. that if that buy starts to work then normally the market is going up and then I'll see other charts that are starting to work and then I'll commit more money. So it's like with, with the energy trade. So when I took this energy trade in Devon, so this trade basically started to work right away. So, so this lets me know that the energy sector for the most part right now and the energy sector of all the ETFs that I track, it's the strongest by RSI. So that tells me that that the energy sector is a place that I want to be looking. You know, if we talk about traders that are looking for what's working right now, I mean, there's a bunch of energy charts now. Now, would this be my ideal buy point? No, it, it wouldn't be. So in, in the Devon position, I I scaled some out of it a little bit lower last week, but I can't say that I would that I would buy this position right here. So I might I might look for stocks that are coming out of their base. Uh, you know, if we take a chart like say tech resources, and and I made this the chart of the day for my website members today. You see, this this is over four moving averages. It's coming out of a pretty constructive price base and, and it's close to breakout level. So if I had to buy a stock today, this is the type of a chart that I would be looking for up in that upper right-hand corner and over rising moving averages. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So I might just, uh, we'll finish up in a sec, but I just want to ask you a little bit more about um, sector selection and rotation, which you just touched on a little bit there. I've seen you sure. talk about this uh, in your, I think it was in your Twitter feed. Can you give us a little bit more of an indication on how um, sector rotation or selection um, you know, what part does that play in your trading? Mm, maybe 50%, a little, little bit less than 50%. I always want to focus on the single stock. But here's the thing. If I find, so I'll give you an example. If I find a stock, let's say Alcoa. So this is, is an aluminum stock that's in an uptrend. And, and the chart will eventually show up. But this, so it, it, this is a pretty good uptrend. But what I do know is that of all the, the industrial metals, steel, copper, Alcoa is really the only one that's acting well. The, the rest of them like Freeport and Nucor, they're pretty far down on their chart. So ideally, if I'm looking at two stocks, if I'm looking at a strong stock in a weak sector, and right now the industrial metals sector is a little bit weaker. It's right down around the 200-day moving average. So if, I, if I've got my choice between a strong stock in a weak sector and a strong stock in a strong sector, I'm going to go with the strong stock in the strong sector. Mm, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks, uh, yeah. Larry. Um, well, I think we'll finish up with one more question here in the okay. chat. Um, I can't bypass it because it's Ola. So Ola again. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you scale into a position. Sorry, you scale into position, but do you also scale out? So it's actually just the opposite. So when I take my position, I, I try to get the entire position right away. So when I, when I take the position, and the reason is that in the past, I, I got sometimes I would get whipsawed. So I I take my position, the stock would go up five percent. I would add to it. And then the stock would pull back 10%. And now I went from a good trade to a bad trade. So, so what I do, I try to get my full position right away. And then as it starts to go up, um, uh, if I get stopped out, I get out of all of it. 
But if the stock starts to go up and I want to try to take some gains, I might sell 20 or 25% of the position. So I've locked in some gains, but I'm still holding for the potentially bigger move. Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so how about just in summary, then you've covered a lot of points for us today. Um, how about uh, for traders who are watching the markets right now and wondering uh, what, what could be happening? What types of things should they look for? Well, the first thing I would look for, it, well, actually two things. I would take a look at the index and I focus more on the index in the pullbacks than I do in the uptrends. But the first mm. thing is to take a look at the index, see if there's any stability in the index. The second thing is to look at the leading stocks. So the leading stocks have been technology. Apple's a little bit weaker. NVIDIA has been strong. That's weaker. Right now, the, 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 the former leading stocks are weaker, but I would also be on the lookout for what sectors are working because what I try to do is I'm trying to consistently and, and gradually move my equity curve higher. So even though I've got a lot more cash than usual, I always want to know what's working. So right now, the banks are working, the energy stocks are working, some of the cyclicals are working. So, but but that's what I would look at. The key thing is I want to see these, these lower price lows go away. But as long as you've got, you know, indices that are making lower lows and you've got leading stocks making lower lows, that's more cautious. And if I was looking for, you know, if, if you've got someone that's looking for strength, you, you know, you can just look at the market. You can run a relative strength screener and it's going to be loaded with energy stocks and bank stocks right now. And you can make a lot of money in those. I mean, energy stocks, you know, a couple of these energy stocks are up 30 percent in the past month. I mean, you can make a lot of money in these cyclicals once they start to work. Mm. Yep. All right. Well, thanks a lot for your time today, Larry. You shared a lot of ideas with us and insights. So thank you very much. Now, if people wanted to get in touch with you or uh, discover more from you, where can they go? Two ways. So the, the easiest way, my website, bluechipdaily.com. And then you can go through it. It goes through all the members' benefits. And then also my Twitter page. So it's at LMT978. It, it used to be my name and nobody could ever spell my name. <laughs> so, so I just made it my, my initials and my zip code, my area code at the time. And then I tried to change it. And when I changed it, everybody said, I didn't know it was you because I'm so, but that's the, this is the <laughs> easiest way to find me. And, and if people are more interested, let's say in the technical aspect, if you go onto my website, uh, Blue Chip Daily, and you go on to the top performers tab. Basically, this will take you through about a year and a half. Uh, and, and this is, you know, real time screenshots, but that'll take people through about a year and a half of, you know, stocks that I saw, you know, what was the entry signal? What was the, the technical process that told me, you know, to buy that stock or put the stock on the buy list? So there's a lot of, of, really, you know, technical nuts and bolts that are on that page. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Larry. So is there anything you'd like to uh, mention before we wrap up for today? Uh, basically, no. Thank you for having me on, Andrew. I, I always appreciate it. I don't know if I, I've been trying to look at the camera. I'm not sure if I've got that <laughs> right. I'm not. I'm, I'm better. Well. Luckily, I'm better with charts than I am with all the technical things. But, uh, you know, I want to... <laughs> I, I want to thank your your audience. They asked some great, great questions. Uh, I want to thank you. I, I really enjoyed it. You're a true professional, uh, and I just enjoy the opportunity. And I will say this. There is always money to be made, and, and we're going to come through on the other side of this, and whether it's in tech stocks, bank stocks, treasuries, agriculture, there's money to be made always. Yeah, what a way to uh, end the show. So, Thanks again for your time, Larry, and thank you to everyone who uh, participated today. We had some great questions. Prize goes to Ola for I don't know how many questions Ola asked today, maybe six or yeah. seven. So uh, that was Ola's great. Ola's the yeah, best. Good... Yeah, Ola. <laughs> I wish I had a prize. I don't have a prize, but maybe a little bit of glory. I don't know. But uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for your time today, Larry. We really appreciate it. And we wish you all the best. And thanks, uh, everyone, for joining us today. Thank Cheers. you so much. Cheers. Take care. Okay, bye.